much for um, putting this conference together. I'm going to take off my mask so you can read my lips if you need to. Um, and also, especially thank you to Jesse, Nancy, and Joe, and Dr. Haley for your amazing talk yesterday. Um, so, today I'm going to be discussing the work of incarcerated trans artist Krista Morningstar. Um, this is what I wrote in my abstract, but I argue that Morningstar, through her comics, participates in what I call trans world making strategies. Um, that is, she uses her comics as a platform for dialogue with the quote unquote free world, attending to the often brutal reality of queer life under carcerality and resisting the isolation caused by imprisonment while envisioning, envisioning excuse me, possible trans abolitionist uh, futures. And I wanted to, before I jump in too deep, uh, I brought three of ABO's um, anthologies that Krista's work is in with me, as well as Krista's anthology. Um, and I put them out on the table, and I super encourage people while I'm talking to go up and grab them and flip through them if you want. Um, I'm a huge believer in like holding the object of a comic when you're like listening about comics and talking about comics, so it will not offend me if you don't get up and grab those books and flip through them, I promise. Um, so I want to just start with a quick overview of the project and um, what I mean when I'm talking about trans world making, um, especially in the context of abolitionist thought. Um, and then I'm going to move into some analysis of Morningstar's comics through close reading and um, then sort of end by talking about the broader community and publishing networks that Morningstar's work is included in and shaped by. Um, so this particular line of analysis is part of my dissertation um, in which I am examining the world making strategies used by trans creators in comics and scenes um, contemporarily. That was first introduced to Morningstar's comics in volume one of the ABO Comics Anthology, which is up and about somewhere. Um, I reached out to her first as a pen pal and became friends after that. Um, and so my analysis of her work and really this entire project I'm doing is really indebted to our conversations and um, I think of her as a collaborator in like a limited, you know, acknowledging the limitations of that. But it's really important to me to frame this as a collaborative and intersubjective project instead of uh, trying to position myself as some sort of independent authority. Um, My use of world making builds off Michael Warner and Lauren Berlin's description of queer world making as quote alternate spaces and practices of cultural, communal, and identity construction and knowledge making that are always in process. Um, I also follow Munoz, who's sort of a guiding lane for me, um, understanding of world making as a project of creating a future for queerness within the present moment. Um, I use this idea of world making to examine specifically the kinds of trans identities, communities, and futures that trans artists and activists are gesturing us towards in the here and now. Um, I also see this trans world making project that I'm interested in as extricable from abolition. Um, activists and scholars including Sarah Haley, Eric Stanley, Dean Spade, C.C. McDonald, and uh, Shea Gossett, among others, have highlighted the relationship between the construction of normative and non-normatively gendered bodies through white supremacist and colonial carceral structures. As Gossett puts it, um, gender self-determination is abolitionist in its anti-policing ethos and is ultimately an abolitionist political project. So the trans world making practices that I'm sort of trying to identify are animated by a specifically trans liberatory politic that is abolitionist in its historical and future trajectories. Um, so now to look at some of the actual comics, um, I want to just sort of reiterate that what I'm sort of interested in arguing is that Morningstar is using the formal qualities of comics and often manga specifically um, to theorize her own subjecthood as an incarcerated trans woman and to imagine these sort of uh, new abolitionist trans futures relationally with her readers and her publishers. Um, so I'm going to give like a super quick overview of some of these strategies in comics just so we're all on the same page. Apologies if you're like already super familiar with comics. Um, comics are generally understood as image texts composed as panels arranged variously on a page of some kind. To quote uh, Hilary Shute, uh, comics represent time and space on the page. Through um, the arrangement, shape, and size of panels and their gutters, gutters being the blank space in between panels, um, the interplay between drawing the panels, the page layout, and the text itself, are, uh, offer artists, to quote Elizabeth L. Ruffay, new ways of representing their experiences of temporality, their memories of past events, and their hopes and dreams for the future. In other words, comics let you juxtapose simultaneously within the sort of same visual space of the page um, and within a book. Uh, multiple experiences, points of view, times, and spaces, both real and imaginary. So they're very self-reflexive. Um, and expanding on this, um, reading comics sort of can function as a dialogue to borrow Ezra Sepp's argument. 
Um, she describes comics as a mediation between three bodies. Those are the drawer, the reader, and then the actual material object, the comic, becoming sort of a third body where this engagement is taking place between the drawer and the reader. Um, which I think is really helpful for understanding uh, some of, especially what Morningstar is doing with interactivity that I'll talk about in a little bit. So I'm going to start with Krista's, or excuse me, Morningstar's first comic published with ABO, Diatribes of a Morningstar Number 1. From here on out, I'm going to say Krista when I'm talking about the drawn avatar of Krista on the page, and Morningstar to talk about her as the artist making those decisions. In this comic, Morningstar... Morningstar uses the magical girl transformation, which is a common trope in Japanese magical girl manga, to transform herself on the page into the way that she understands herself to be. So here you can see she sort of is, then this page she's sort of uh, testing out this performance of femininity, and then on this second page we've got this panel where she literally goes magical girl transform and like <laughs> becomes the version of herself again, as sort of a shorthand uh, for her transformation. Um, Magical girls uh, are also hyper-feminine symbols, um, suggesting for Morningstar an adoption of femininity as strength and empowerment in the face of the oppressive masculine structures that she's bound within. Her true self-portrait um, is displaced through the use of the mirror on the previous page as a symbol of dysphoria rather than reflecting a real or authentic version of her that's seen by other people. So the post-transformation avatar becomes the authentic Krista, both within the panels that show her daily life, um, as she often uses a sort of slice of life approach, and as a narrator that often moves beyond the bounds of the, panel, the panels to directly speak to the reader. All right. Her avatar's role as a narrator also can work to destabilize the power dynamic of her experience of incarceration by letting her recast the terms of that incarceration. So in this comic, which concludes with the guards discovering her use of contraband makeup, Krista on the page looks thoughtful, commenting, I'll take this as a lesson learned and watch out for the guards next time. So you can sort of see this long speech bubble of her narration following her to, she's sort of standing in the back, like, hmm, as the guards are punishing her. This at least partially wrests control from the guard inflicting punishment back to her as she uses this depiction of a presumably real punishment to create a moment of resistance that demonstrates a refusal to comply with the terms of her imprisonment. She further highlights the importance of community bonds within the prison as she draws the other prisoners noticing her experience positively, suggesting some sense of community support from her fellow inmates. Her positive relationship with the other prisoners is contrasted against the oppressive force of the CEOs, gesturing towards a collectivity that works in opposition to repress heteronormative structures. Um, she further uses her comics to negotiate the various penal spaces that she's in, which, um, to sort of borrow Nicole Fleetwood's de uh, definition as not just the prison itself, but the, quote, disruption of family relations and domestic space and the restrictive and highly monitored experience of the environments the incarcerated are kept in. Throughout her comics, Krista frequently shifts between locations from presumably accurate depictions of prison interior, including her house or cell, where she draws herself often at work, sort of a self-reflexive action, to various imagined environments that allow her to play with how she represents her incarceration. So for example, in this comic, which is called Meet Crazy Krista, she begins with this series of all black panels where it seems like she's talking to multiple people while again sort of breaking the fourth wall. And then the bottom panel, the bottom half of the page, which is I've kind of duplicated so you can see it bigger, um, we see that she is filled in as Krista by herself, standing in this imagined space of the highway, and then that sign in the corner suggests that this is a representation of inner Krista. Um, even within her head, though, this uh, prison space is not entirely escapable. This particular comic ends with her being driven back to the prison hospital by her husband, who's also incarcerated with her, where the fantasy of driving on the highway is replaced with her waking up back inside the prison space. Krista visually changes within this comic as well, with uh, the inner Krista sort of Harley Quinn cosplay, you can sort of see, um, replaced with the usual way that she draws the Krista avatar, symbolizing return to her reality. Um, I think this is a useful example to show how Morningstar can use the comics page to sort of like both visualize the interior of the prison alongside imagined other geographies so that she has the uh, space to process the events that she's experiencing. In her second diatribe comic, which is also published in the first ABO Comics anthology, um, Morningstar places Krista in an imagined pastoral scene. So here you see her in a, in a, at a sort of park, sitting on a, a blanket, having lunch, right? 
and writes, uh, prisons are said to be the yardstick of the society you live in, but that for her, quote, the problem I run into the most, however, is transphobia. While well, episode one documents Morningstar's specific experiences with transphobia in the prison, she uses episode two to link her experience with transphobia while incarcerated to the oppression of trans people outside of the prison as well, further emphasized by her decision to conjure a neutral meeting space for the reader to, quote, have lunch with her. Through her comic, Morningstar creates a scenario for community building, putting her, at least a little bit, on equal terms with the reader regardless of the incarcerated stash, incarceration status of the reader. Um, and Olivia Wright's essay, Literary Vandals, American Women's Prison Zines as Collective Autobiography, Wright argues that, quote, the creation, distribution, and reading of a zine can form another temporal structure that pushes against the authoritative structure of the institution of the prison, creating a third space, to borrow Ruth Wilson Gilman's phrase, Gilmore's phrase, excuse me, um, <laughs> that exists within and even despite of the carceral states. When I start's decisions to reach through the comic page towards her readers and the scene gesture to a similar practice, as does the way that the comics are actually created and distributed. And so for the rest of this talk, I want to talk a little bit about the context of their creation and distribution through ABO Comics, um, which is important to how she positions her work as interactive with her readers. I'm very heavily influenced by Wright and by Nicole Fleetwood for this analysis, um, particularly as Fleetwood argues in Marking Time, that the artistic and creative practices used by incarcerated artists, quote, fight the punitive isolation and severance that prisons compose, impose. And a key part of this analysis is the relational component of what she calls carceral aesthetics as, quote, practices that project across the carceral divides and that create meaningful engagement not bound by the prison. Similarly, prison zines do a sort of similar work. Like Wright argues, the women's prisoner zines that she analyzes uh, quote, attempt to counter the restrictions of incarcerated spaces by bridging gaps between women, both through print networks like letter writing, pen pals, exchanges, and through the literal spaces, both inside prisons and outside, where zines are created, printed, and distributed from. Um, ABO Comics performs a very similar work, describing the production practices as based on a DOI slash punk zine ideology. So even though um, these books are not zines in the formatting in the sense that they are you know, they have a spine, they have an ISBN, they are sort of perfect bound books. They perform a sort of social function similar to zines where they are treated as zine objects and distributed through a zine-based ethics, which is deliberately um, anti-capitalist, right? Um, and there's also, I don't have time to get into it all, but there is a long history of prisoner zines and uh, this fits into that lineage as well. Um, so ABO Comics, just as a little overview, is a collective incarcerated artists and free world activist allies who, to quote them, work to amplify the voices of LGBTQ prisoners through art. Their main project is the ongoing ABO anthologies, which I have three of here. Um, they release these about once a year. They've really kicked up their production lately, so they're starting to come out really fast. <laughs> um, these anthologies are a collection of comics by incarcerated artists who they work with as editors and publishers. Um, often frequently the same artists from book to book, so they establish these sort of long-running relationships. Um, profits from the book are then given to the contributing artists, so the incarcerated artists are actually seeing financial benefits from contributing their labor to the project, in addition to other supplemental like fundraising that ABO does. Um, ABO also, in their online store, has an option to buy a copy of any zine or book directly for an incarcerated person, and they also provide copies free of charge to any LGBT prisoner who writes and just requests one. According to an interview I conducted with co-founder and current director Casper uh, Sendry in 2019, they have, at least at that time, distributed hundreds of copies of their books to prisons, with very few actually being rejected. Um, not sure how much that number has increased in the wake of COVID, but I know at least there's quite a, quite a presence. Um, additionally, through their presence at Conic and Zine Fest, like this picture of them at the Liquid Book Fair, ABO circulate their prisoners' comics in the same network as other queer and trans comic artists and zinesters. Through the creation and distribution of these anthologies, alongside the distribution of other zines and comics made by incarcerated queer artists, ABO potentially creates new paths of communication, a third space, for queer and trans, incarcerated and non-incarcerated artists and readers. ABO makes queer and trans prisoner lives visible to the outside queer slash trans community in a time when mainstream gay politics have moved towards assimilation away from engaging with radical abolitionist movements. By bringing together this patchwork of incarcerated artists' voices and work, ABO creates a site of communal identity formation and resistance for their artists, 
Though the uh, contributors come from different prisons across the United States, their presence in the book together aligns them as part of the same network of queer and trans artists that form the ABO Comics Collective. And as a member of that network, Morningstar has made connections with other incarcerated trans people who have read her work in the anthology and reached out to ABO, which can help demonstrate the anthology's ability to bridge some, at least partially, the isolation and invisibility of imprisonment. For Morningstar, the anthologies have also allowed her to share the strategies she has developed to realize her trans identity while incarcerated. So for example, to go back to diatribe number one, Morningstar records her process of creating makeup from items that are accessible to her, for instance, a black colored pencil for eyebrows, Mary, making Mary Janes from shower shoes. And doing that, so she's creating subtly a how-to guide for other incarcerated trans femmes, generating within her comic a form of trans collectivity that not only expresses the ingenuity of incarcerated trans people to um, a non-incarcerated audience, but may in fact also help other trans prisoners who read her comic. Also notable here is how teeny tiny she's actually written the instructions on this panel. They're super hidden in the bottom. And knowing her, I'm... <laughs> Reasonably sure that's at least partially to make it easier to get by the gaze of the warden yeah. who would reject the book, right, for arbitrary reasons. Um, I'm also reminded of C.C. McDonald's practice of imaginative abolition, um, described in her foreword to the second edition of Captive Genders. In her letter, McDonald describes extending her fantasy of gaining superpowers to kicking down the walls of the prison to her work educating herself and others. I'm not going to rehash this. I think Lavelle just did a fantastic job talking about this. Um, but Morningstar similarly draws on the imaginative through her comics to try and educate the reader she imagines herself to, in conversation with as she is documenting her own learning experiences. Morningstar has described her pro comics practice to me as a way to, quote, try and influence the world through her use of her strategies like breaking the fourth wall. She frequently invites her readers into dialogue, explicitly frames her comics as interactive objects, with these long written diatribes and essays that accompany the end of her comics. And another example of this kind of interactive work is in her anthology, um, this image that explains how to draw Krista. She describes this image as a reference to keep her own work consistent, but we can also read it as an invitation to draw Krista ourselves. If we do draw fan art of Krista, we might even think of that as another way to extend the avatar of Krista beyond the walls of the prison, which is another way that Morningstar uses these interactive elements to build relationships with her readers. Thank you. Um, Morningstar also frequently includes advice and resources in her comics, most usually related to transition, navigating transphobia, and drawing art. She invites readers to connect with her as pen pals. She has an email address that ABO and I monitor to share correspondence with her. And this year, she also launched a Patreon managed by ABO, where she is sharing new comics works with describing readers. ABO in this way becomes a tool for Morningstar to forge connections across the lines of the prison and build community in resistance to the carceral states. However, her, prison, her presence within ABO's distribution networks and more broadly, DOIZ trans print cultures is equally marked by her absence. Um, in other words, though Krista can be visible outside of the prison, Morningstar herself can only participate through mediated and limited means, including my presence here, right, talking about her work. Um, and if I could point, like, if you remember the picture of us together, even in that picture, she's still behind glass, right? Um, nonetheless, ABO's anthologies gesture us towards alternative formations of trans community that, following Fleetwood, provide a way of seeing and engaging culture fundamental to envisioning freedom in a world without cages. And I'm just going to super quickly mention to end here, um, Morningstar is working on a book, a how to draw manga book. Um, and what captures me about this project is how the book fits into Morningstar's understanding of art as a life-saving, world-making practice. In her anthology, Morningstar describes art making as a substitute for her, quote, inability to bear children, making her practice both an extension of her transgendered experience and also pointing us towards the way that she positions futurity within her work and is central to her work. Um, so by offering a how to draw book, I think Morningstar is extending her practice out to her readers, inviting them to share in her perspective of art, and in doing so, she's inviting us to share in the potential trans, trans futures that she imagines. Thank you. And then this, here's all the stuff on where to find Krista's work, where to find ABO's work, and I'm done. <laughs>